Hello, students. This week, we have another session for solving problems, and we're choosing chapter 11, problem number 88, how to determine the number of sigma and pi bonds in an organic structure. So the problem reads, the structure of acetyl salicylic acid, which essentially is aspirin, is shown below. How many pi bonds are present? How many sigma bonds are present? And what parts of the molecule are free to rotate? what parts of the molecule are rigid. So the first thing I want to review is we have to understand that all single bonds are free to rotate. We also have to understand that what we call a single bond is really a sigma bond. So when we talk about hybridized orbitals, what we have is initially you have to have a direct internuclear overlap between two carbons to form a bond. And that hybridized orbital is referred to as a sigma bond. Or we can denote sigma with the Greek symbol. So you have to always have a sigma bond because for the two carbons to be bound, there has to be a direct internuclear overlap. So their orbitals, these regions of space where the electrons are occupied, have to overlap so that these can be connected. When I talk in terms of sharing four electrons, so in the past we called this a double bond, we have to understand that now with hybridized orbitals, to have any type of bond, you first have to have one sigma. So I have to have a direct overlap. So one of these is I have one sigma. So what is the other bond? The other bond is the unhybridized p orbital that is actually above and below the plane of the sigma bond, okay? So it's perpendicular, it's at a 90 degree angle. So if the sigma's on the x-axis, you can think of the unhybridized p orbital is on the y, and this would have one, and this would have another. And what ends up happening in this unhybridized orbital, because they're parallel to the other carbon's hybridized, unhybridized orbital, it creates what's referred to as a pi cloud above and below the plane. So that second bond, which we used to call a double, is my pi bond. And essentially, I can just write it as one pi. So a single bond is one sigma. The old double bond is one sigma and one pi. Well, what if I have a triple? If I have a triple bond, again, I have to have that sigma direct internuclear overlap. I already had the one pi, which was perpendicular, right? On if this is my x axis, this is my y. But the other bond has to be perpendicular to not just this original sigma and not just this original pi cloud. It has to, or, or it has to also be perpendicular to that pi cloud. So instead of going on the x and y axis, it goes on the z, which is in front of the board and behind the board. So it's hard to draw this in 3D, but it's going in front and behind. So it's perpendicular to the pi cloud that's above and below. So essentially, a triple bond has the one sigma, but now it has the two pi's that are perpendicular. So when I look at a structure and I want to know how many pi bonds, that's easy. I could look at the number of multiple bonds. So in this structure, how many pi bonds are present? Well, I see that I have, you know, a double bond here. I have a double bond here. I have a double bond here. I have a double bond here. And I have a double bond here. Each double bond gives me one pi, gives me a sigma but it also gives me one pi. So because there are five double bonds, that means I have five pi bonds. Now what's harder is determining the number of sigma bonds. So it might seem easy because, you know, sigma we can associate with just a bond and if there's a line. But one of the problems with organic structures, when they show them in books and line formula, they don't always show you all of the carbons and hydrogens. So for example, 
there's a carbon right there. There's a carbon right there, right there, right there, all around this ring. There's a carbon there. There's a carbon there. And there's a carbon on this terminal end. Now, why is that important? Every carbon has to have four bonds. So if I look at carbon number one, and I look at this carboxylic acid group that's attached to carbon number one, I see carbon number one already has four bonds. So does the carbon in this carboxylic acid. If I go to carbon number two right here, I see that it has four bonds, one, two, and then the sigma and the pi. So I'm good. The remainder of this cyclic structure, so the carbon number three, four, carbon five, and carbon six, they all only have three bonds. Well, they have to have four. So the picture only shows three bonds because we have alternating doubles and alternating singles. But what they're not drawing is that there are hydrogens right here. So what they're not showing are those hydrogens. What they're also not showing is that this terminal carbon has three hydrogens attached so that it can have its four bonds. So now when we're trying to determine the number of sigma bonds, we can do it a little bit easier, right? Because I can just look at the number of attached molecules. Now I need it, or atoms. What I need to be careful is in this OH group, there is a sigma bond between this oxygen and hydrogen. But if I go around now, I can actually count the number of bonds and get this right. I'm gonna start with carbon number one and go around the cyclic structure. So I have right there, there is one sigma. Remember in the double bond, there's one sigma, one pi. I already counted the pi. So there's two sigma, three sigma, four, five sigma, seven sigma. And now I can count the hydrogens that are attached. Whoops, sorry about that. Right here, there's eight sigma, nine, 10, 11 sigma bonds. Now I can go to what's um, attached to the cyclic structure, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So I have 21 sigma bonds. What's tricky is what part of the molecule is free to rotate and what part of the molecule is rigid. So whenever you're looking at structures, and I'm gonna go ahead and erase all this because we need to, I wanna look at this cleanly. When we're looking at structure, single bonds can rotate. Double and triple bonds cannot rotate. The reason why double and triple bonds can't rotate is the pi clouds are perpendicular to the sigma bonds and they can't rotate or they'll break. So, if I look over here in my example of a single bond with a sigma, I can rotate freely around this internuclear overlap. So single bonds can rotate. Now, whenever there's a double bond, I can't rotate because this pi cloud would break. Same with triple bonds. So you do not have free rotation. So when I'm looking at aspirin, right? Whatever is rigid is a little bit easier to figure out. So one example is cyclic structures are always rigid, okay? So, you know, what parts are rigid? So one part is the cyclic structure, the aromatic. That is rigid, okay? What else is rigid? So remember, I called this carbon one and carbon two. Attached to carbon one is a carboxylic acid. And actually this part of the molecule is referred to as benzoic acid. But attached to carbon number one, okay, if I look, there's a carboxylic acid and this carbon right here has a double bond 
So this part is also rigid. So I can say they carbonyl attached to carbon number one of the cyclic structure is rigid. If I go to carbon number two, right, what I'm actually seeing is I'm seeing the acetyl group. It's, it's called an ester. So there's a carbon here. And remember, there's that CH3 here. There's a carbon here. And this right here is an example of an acetyl group. But this carbon attached to this double bond here, there's no free rotation. So you can say the carbonyl, right, in the acetyl group, that's attached to the oxygen right here. That's attached to carbon number two of the cyclic structure. So the rigid part is actually easy. The hard part is where is there actually the free rotation? So the free rotation comes in where I can actually twist things around on the cyclic structure. So now let's kind of break that down, right? Where can I, where is there not a double bond where I can twist things, okay? Well, remember everything on the cyclic structure because it's joined, it's rigid. So I go over here and what I notice is I can actually rotate around that group right there because I can twist the top of this around. So that carboxylic acid, that carbon to carbon bond right there is free rotation. The other place where there's free rotation is along this OH right there, there's free rotation. Now that's really hard to see, especially if you haven't done a lot of this. So what I'd like to do is kind of show you the molecular model of this. And it's still gonna to be tough. I'm gonna to do my best uh, with what I have, but right here is carbon number one on that cyclic structure. So this right here would be the carbon number one on the cyclic structure. And here's that carboxylic acid that I'm talking about. So here is the double bond that I'm talking about right here in this picture. And I'm talking about free rotation between the carbon number one that I have in the diagram. So here's carbon one and this carboxylic acid group, there's free rotation right here. So in this picture, that means that there's free rotation around that bond. And you see that I'm rotating that and there's free rotation. I also said that there was free rotation between the carbon in the carbonyl with the oxygen right there in the carboxylic acid, and that this whole top part would spin. So when I go here, if I look on carbon number one, there's free rotation between the two carbons. And then here is the oxygen that has the hydrogen attached. And I can see that there's free rotation there quite easily. There's free rotation. What you do notice is if I try to rotate anything with a double bond, so like if I try to rotate the benzene ring because of the pi cloud, it won't rotate because I'll break it because it's perpendicular. Here's my pi cloud above and below the sigma bond. It will not rotate, does not have free rotation. So that's why it's fixed. So that kind of covers, you know, what's attached to carbon number one, the carboxylic acid. Now the acetooxy group, so my acetooxy group is this right here on carbon number two. If I look at carbon number two, I have an oxygen and an acetyl group. An acetyl group is just carbonyl with a CH3. And when I look at this, the first thing you're gonna recognize is I have free rotation between carbon number two and that oxygen. So in this molecule, right, if this right here is carbon number two, right, I see that there's free rotation between the carbon number two and this oxygen, and this can move 
back and forth. Okay. There's free rotation around the single bond that's between this oxygen and this carbonyl. So there's free rotation right there. So that would look like if I took, here's carbon number two, here's the oxygen, the oxygen that's bound to carbon number two, it's also bound to this carbonyl, and I can keep this bond stiff right here, but I can rotate the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen right there. The last place where there's free rotation, because again, the carbonyl, I can't free rotate right here. Sorry, my hand's in the way. I can't free rotate the carbonyl because it has this pi cloud that's perpendicular to the sigma bond between. And if I rotate, I'm gonna break that pi cloud, okay? So I can't, wherever there's a multiple bond, there's no free rotation. If there's a double or triple bond, you cannot rotate. If there's a cyclic structure, you cannot rotate. So you have to look at where there's single bonds that allow free rotation. So the last single bond that allows this rotation is between this carbonyl and this methyl group where there's free rotation right there. So here's the carbonyl. Again, carbon two. Let me make sure you can see that. Here's carbon two that has the oxy group and the acetyl group. The acetyl group, if you've ever taken um, the Krebs cycle and you talk about, or, or bio and learn about the Krebs cycle, acetyl coenzyme A, this is your acetyl group right here that feeds into the Krebs cycle. Your acetyl group right here, here is the carbonyl and here's that methyl group that I just said has free rotation. So that's right here, there's free rotation. And you can see right there between carbon two, the carbon neal and that CH3 group, there's free rotation right there. So I'm spinning, I'll even move the camera a little bit. I can spin that methyl group all along that axis. So there's free rotation. So, um, this can get tricky. I just wanted to show you and talk about free rotation because that actually goes back to when we learned about uh, alkenes and how double bonds didn't have that free rotation. So you might remember your alkenes back in the past and I could quickly show you what I mean for an easy alkene. So an alkene has a double bond right here, right? So that pi cloud doesn't allow free rotation, right? Because it would break. And that's why I can get different isomers. Right? So I could have this structure and I look and I can't switch it. And that's why this structure, even though it has the same chemical formula, is called a geometric isomer with this structure because of the placement. This would be considered trans because these functional groups are across each other. And we learned that when we did the organic alkene when we talked about cis and trans. So that comes back now when we get to the sigma and pi bonds. Another thing I'd recommend is if you guys are moving on, you would definitely want to buy a chemical chemistry set. I bought that 1989 for 45 bucks. Now on Amazon, you can get it for 15. So it's actually cheaper. <laughs> I would highly recommend that, especially if you're going on to chem, because it is extremely useful, as you can see, to help you figure out problems like this. So that was a little bit longer than I expected, but I was trying to be thorough. I hope you guys appreciate it. Uh, as far as exams, I probably wouldn't have something quite this, you know, tricky as far as the rotation and the rigidity, definitely sigma and pi bonds. So you should be able to count those in organic structures. And um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions and thanks for tuning in.